from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. West Virginia University. Online at wvu.edu. AARP West Virginia. Your ally for real possibilities in the Mountain State. Online at aarp.org slash wv. The West Virginia Higher Education Policy Commission, working to double the degrees produced annually in our state by 2025 through increased opportunities for West Virginians to earn the credentials today's economy demands. The High Technology Foundation, building a stronger West Virginia, online at wvhtf.org. At the legislature today, delegates want to require West Virginians to show some form of identification at their polling place before casting a ballot. For the second time this week, senators debate a bill regulating homeschooling in West Virginia. And the Religious Freedom Restoration Act comes under attack on the Senate floor. We'll bring you some of those floor speeches coming up on the legislature today. I'm Ashton Mara. A bill to require West Virginians to show an ID before casting a ballot was up for a vote in the House of Delegates, but the bill itself doesn't restrict voters to showing just a photo ID. It also allows Medicare or Social Security cards, high school or college IDs, even a friend of more than six months can verify the voter's identity. Still, members of the Democratic Party spoke against the bill, calling it prohibitive. Liz McCormick reports. House Bill 4013 would require West Virginia voters to show a photo ID or some kind of other official documentation to prove their identity before voting at the polls. A voter without proper documentation will be allowed to vote on a provisional ballot. Today, voters sign a book before voting and the poll worker compares that to a previous signature to validate a voter's identity. Supporters of the bill say requiring photo IDs or some other form of official identification will help avoid voter fraud. Those opposed say it will keep people from the polls, bringing in another step to the voting process and possibly increase wait times. During the hour-long debate Friday, members opposed to the bill brought up a number of concerns, including the implications for senior citizens. Delegate Tim Manchin is a Democrat from Marion County. He worries if the bill passes, an elderly person who shows up to the polls without proper identification will be embarrassed or uncomfortable if pulled aside to fill out a provisional ballot. For many of our folks, our older folks, who are over 75 or whatever age it might be, they're going to get embarrassed because they've been singled out. They're going to feel humiliated. Many of them are going to say, I have been voting here for 30 years and I've never had this problem. Nobody's ever done this to me. Now, what's that going to do to them the next time around? I think we all know in this room that they are going to be much, much less likely to participate as voters the next time around. Delegate Gary Howell, a Republican from Mineral County, says the elderly population is more likely to be aware of what's going on at the State House. The elderly among our voters are probably our most educated voters. They're the ones that are more likely to know about this law going into effect. My guess is when they show up at the polls, they're going to be the ones that definitely have the ID, the ID with them. And to those that say that this may be a voter suppression bill, after this goes into effect, we may find out they're absolutely right, but not in the way that they want, believe. The voters that are being suppressed may be the ones that are actually committing the fraud. Delegate Don Perdue, a Democrat from Wayne County, believes there are other issues that aren't addressed in the bill. I am going to vote against this bill for a number of reasons. The major one being it doesn't really address the big problem. That's absentee ballots in West Virginia. The other thing I see, and I, and I believe that it can be disputed, I would expect it would be, is that it will cause voters to not go to the polls. It was spoken of earlier that we have more people in some places who are registered to vote than actually live in those counties. Well, I would assure you, <laughs> we have a whole lot more people in our counties who live there than are registered to vote. 
And that's not an issue we really dealt with with this bill. Delegate Patrick Lane of Kanawha County is the lead sponsor of the bill. He defended the bill, stating there's nothing in the language that would keep anyone from voting, even if they didn't have an ID. I would challenge you to get off the talking points page, stop reading the talking points, stop reading all the stuff that somebody handed you that you can get wound up and scream and yell and carry on about, and start reading the bill in front of us. Read the bill. Read the bill. Not just say, I don't like voter ID. Read the bill. And if you can go through this bill and find somebody who you believe will not be able to vote or comply with this bill, let me know. And if it passes out of this house, I'll run over to the Senate and say we need to change this. House Bill 4013 passed 64 to 34 and now goes to the Senate for consideration. If passed by the Senate and signed by the governor, the bill would go into effect January 1st, 2018. For the legislature today, I'm Liz McCormick in the House. A bill to repeal Common Core education standards and assessments in West Virginia is making its way through the House of Delegates, but has slowed in the Chamber's Education Committee. Rob Engel has more. Members of the House Education Committee spent three meetings last week discussing a bill that would require the state to repeal Common Core. After hours of testimony, committee chair, Delegate Paul Espinoza, pulled the bill before putting it to a vote, explaining he wanted to give members more time to digest the information shared. This morning, the committee put the bill back on the agenda, but didn't discuss it. In December, members of the West Virginia Board of Education voted to repeal the Common Core-based standards they had in place, replacing them with a new set, the West Virginia College and Career Ready Standards. These standards were the result of an eight-month study led by State Superintendent Dr. Michael Martirano, consulting West Virginia teachers and higher education officials as well as members of the public. But lawmakers have continued to voice their concerns over the standards, saying they are too similar to the previous Common Core-aligned set. Education Chair Espinoza says the delay in the vote doesn't mean the bill is going away. He anticipates continued discussion in his committee. Essentially what the committee substitute would do is it would codify the repeal that the board uh, uh, made uh, uh, last year. Uh, also uh, calls upon the uh, board to work collaboratively, we continue to work collaboratively with the legislature to address remaining concerns that there are with the standards. And then the um, uh, proposed committee substitute also deals with the whole question of testing. Again, that's that's probably one of the things that uh, there seems to be the widest uh, agreement on is that, you know, the the uh, current uh, summative assessment, uh, uh, you know, is just not the uh, perhaps the assessment that that best fits the needs of West Virginia. Education Chair Delegate Paul Espinosa says his committee will consider a committee substitute a new version of the bill that makes changes to the introduced version. For the legislature today, I'm Rob Engel in the House. Senators have discussed several pieces of legislation this session dealing with homeschooled students in the state. Earlier this week, we saw the passage of a bill that would allow the group to participate in athletic programs at public schools. Today, members discussed a bill making changes to assessment reporting. When a parent decides to homeschool his or her child in West Virginia, current state law requires that child take an annual assessment detailing their progress. Those annual results are then to be presented to the superintendent in the county in which they live. House Bill 4175 would change those requirements. Instead of reporting test results annually, the bill says they would only have to be reported in grades 3, 5, 8, and 11. Senator Mike Romano offered an amendment Friday to put the annual reporting requirements Requirements back in place. You know, I, I certainly recognize that we have great results from homeschool children for 90 percent of the homeschool children, but there's a percentage that use homeschooling to gain the system. We have a constitutional obligation to make sure that every child receives a good education in this state. If not, we're going to breed failures. Now, we have problems in the public school system that need to be addressed, and that's what I hear the most from advocates who do not want to have homeschool advocates that don't want to have any contact with the school system. Yes, we do have problems, but we don't want to create additional failures 
out of the homeschooling process. Senator Robert Carnes, who homeschools his eight children, disagreed with Romano. He says parents will continue to conduct the annual assessment whether it has to be reported or not because the tests allow them to track their child's progress. This amendment is designed to perpetuate some of the burdensome regulations that homeschoolers currently have to face. And this is one of the most effective forms of education we have today in West Virginia. Our, our public school system is struggling very mightily in in this state and and I would submit that rather than come after the education system in West Virginia that is working very well we should focus on and and I fully support uh, making great efforts and, and we've seen a bill recently related to minutes giving more flexibility to counties we don't need to load homeschoolers up with red tape we need to figure out how to take the red tape off of our teachers, off of our local county school boards. The Senate Education Committee Chair, Senator Dave Seipolt, says the amendment was offered in committee and failed. It also failed on the floor in a party line vote, 18 to 16. Members of the Senate will vote on the bill tomorrow. Robert Carnes is a Republican from Upshur County. He was elected to represent the Senate's 11th District in 2014. Karn serves as the chair of the Senate Committee on Natural Resources and the vice chair of the Interstate Cooperation Committee. Ron Walters was elected to the West Virginia House of Delegates in 1992. He served for four years and was again elected to the post in 2000 after a brief hiatus. A Republican, he's from Kanawha County and represents the House's 39th District. Delegate Walters serves as the chair of the House Banking Committee, and his son, Chris Walters, serves as a member of the West Virginia Senate. Tim Armstead is the Speaker of the House of Delegates, taking over the post in 2015. A Republican, he's from Kanawha County and represents the 40th House District. He was appointed to his seat in 1998 and has won re-election to the chamber since. Speaker Armstead previously served as the minority leader for eight legislative sessions. It's been a little over a week since delegates approved a bill creating the West Virginia Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Known as RIFRA, the bill creates a judicial standard for cases where a person's religious freedoms are infringed upon by a government entity. The bill has been assigned to a Senate committee but has yet to make its way onto an agenda. Still, that hasn't stopped members of the upper chamber from voicing their thoughts about the bill on the floor this week. Restoration Act. And I wanted to point out to you in the Charleston paper yesterday, there were a couple articles. Uh, one said that medical groups oppose uh, RIFRA for why they believe it will deteriorate uh, health of the citizens in West Virginia. Also, another article indicating that many businesses in Charleston are rising up to oppose this bill and are going to be having stickers that say all kinds are welcome here. I would encourage uh, Mr. President, you and the other members to support those businesses who are standing up for all West Virginians. Also, I'd like to uh, point out to you that you know the bill we passed earlier this session, the Right to Work bill, which, uh, which I think you believe and the majority party believes will help open the door to opportunities in this state. Although I'm not convinced that'll happen, I certainly hope it will. Uh, I would tell you that if we pass this bill, it's gonna slam that door shut. You need to look no further than what happened in Indiana last year. They passed this bill. Uh, one of their tourism people said that uh, the, the backlash in Indiana has been unprecedented following that. They have lost conventions. They have lost, you know, businesses have been very upset about it. They lost 12 conventions that they said the, peop the people directly identified passage of that bill as the reason why they're not coming there. You probably know that Charleston has, is investing about a hundred million dollars to restore and renovate the Civic Center here and I would suggest to you that if we pass this bill that money will be largely wasted because we'll ex experience the same thing here so I just want to encourage you Mr. President uh, as you're interested in opening up opportunities for West Virginia to tread very carefully uh, as you consider what we're going to do with that bill. We have a bill over here, House Bill 4012, 
that is probably one of the most draconian bills I have ever seen, yet we don't have anybody stepping up and saying what they're going to do. But I can go, I'm going to go on record in telling you I am not for that bill. That, you know, I don't care what, you know, the churches say about, you know, I can go back to my church, and I can go back to my pastor and tell him I don't believe in discrimination. I don't believe that we should be discriminating in any way. I don't want us to go back to the 50s and 60s and different things that I saw when I was growing up when there were riots all the time and different things like this. So us going, you know, backward is not going to move our economy forward. And I would really like for people to issue what they think on this as well because we don't need to be fooling our time and wasting our time here on issues such as that. If we are truly open for business, Mr. President, we will be open for business. We will open all of our businesses. We fought for 30 days in this chamber over right to work. Right to work. Yet there's one group of people in this state, those of the LGBT community, that don't have a right to work. They can be fired tomorrow if their employer doesn't like it because they're gay or they don't like their sexual orientation. That's wrong. We all know it's wrong. People ought to be judged and based upon the value of the work and the effort they give to our communities and in the workplace. And should nobody in this state should get up and go to bed or go to work or get out of bed and go to work and worry about being fired because their employer doesn't like who they love or who they go home to at night after they clock out. It's none of their business. If we want to move our state forward, Mr. President, if we truly want to make our state move forward, we will be disinclusive. We will be diverse and we will be welcoming. We will not set up barriers and walls that keep people from wanting to come and more importantly, that drive our people away. I hope anybody that knows me knows that I would never stand up to support anything where I think people are going to be mistreated. And I'm sorry to report to you, Mr. President, that the opponents of this bill have won the battle, I think, of misinformation with our constituents, with the media, and even with members of this body. I'm also aware that perception is reality unless one knows the truth. I'm learning uh, in my session and a half here that hyperbole and falsehoods accompany both sides of issues that are argued in this body and that the truth is usually somewhere in the middle. Today my goal is to outline what I see as the facts of this issue and some things that this bill will do and will not do. First of all, House Bill 4012 does not allow people to do anything in the name of religion. It simply reestablishes a balancing test for resolving cases when state action conflicts with religious practices. It does not allow or incentivize discrimination in any way. It does not create any new cause of legal action. It's completely defensive in nature, Mr. President. It's a shield. It's not a sword nor a club. It does not apply to private sector employee-employer relations only to situations where government has acted in some way. I notice that there are 18 people in this chamber who have either voted for or sponsored this legislation. And I would ask you, what's different this time? What's different? Well, some will say there's a Supreme Court ruling about marriage. Truth is, that law doesn't impact this one, and this one doesn't impact that one. I don't know what the difference is, but I would ask you, Folks, let's stop putting our fingers up and, and feeling the political winds before we vote. Let's vote and do what we think is the right thing. The House Committee on Government Organization heard testimony this morning about House Bill 4472. The bill would require county commissions to review and approve any regulations passed by local county boards of health. 
Most of the speakers were health care professionals and opposed the bill, saying it's the result of special interest groups who want to get rid of indoor smoking regulations. Only one citizen supported the measure. Here's a look at some of the comments about House Bill 4472. House Bill 4472 would require commissions to approve the local Board of Health rules effectively turning health issues into political issues. For the most part, county commissioners do not possess the proper qualifications to adopt, amend, or revoke public health rules and regulations. State and local boards of health were created to perform this function. This 4472 is targeting one local board. In Upshur County, I have 16 local boards that are directly appointed, uh, members are appointed by the county commission. That includes the Board of Health, the Building Commission, the Civil Service Board, the Enhanced Emergency Telephone Board, the Farmland Protection Board, the Fire Board, the James W. Curry Advisory Board, the LECPC Board, which is the Local Emergency Planning Commission, the Library Board, the Public Service Districts, Region 7, the Solid Waste Authority Board, the Safe Sites and Structures Board, the Local County Development Authority, the Youth uh, Camp Board, the Buchanan Upshur Airport Authority. The 4472 needs to be include all boards or none, none of them. If you want young people to stay here, I don't think taking away their clean air is a smart thing to do. And having healthy people is an important thing for our future if you want people to stay here and work and grow West Virginia's economy. Thank you. I've only been in this position for a little over two years, and during this time, the Barber County Board of Health enacted stricter smoke-free regulations effective October 1st, 2014. For the regulation proposal, we had two public hearings that were advertised and very few people attended. Only one business owner attended, and she said that she would like an exemption in gambling rooms only. She even said that she did not want her young sons to be around secondhand smoke. All the rest of the people who attended were in favor of the stricter regulations. After the regulation went into effect, a disgruntled business owner, who was a smoker, came to the Board of Health meeting asking for an exemption. Mind you, she was the only one. She said, we all know smoking is bad for you, but we want to allow smoking in our private club. The board decided that the health and well-being of all Barber County residents was more important than the regulation, than, than her, and the regulation stood as it was. I'm coming to you from a little bit of a different group this morning. Um, I'm coming to you from the various entertainers uh, on behalf of our state. I have been a member of an improv troupe now for over 10 years. I work with lots of stand-up comedians. I work with lots of musicians. I've performed with other people. And one of the things that we love is giving West Virginians something to do, giving them that nightlife. And one of the things we really love about what we're able to do is that we can go out and entertain people, maybe even make a little extra to help pay the bills. but. We provide that nightlife, we provide that, and we love the fact that we've been able to do that now for many years in a smoke-free environment. If we start opening up the doors to lesser regulation, then suddenly I think you're gonna find a lot of the performers are even gonna kinda of take a step back from this because we don't wanna be exposed to these things in an uncontrollable situation. We wanna go and have a good time, we wanna entertain people, make sure they walk away having a good time as well. But if we're being exposed to these toxins, it kinda of takes out a lot of the fun. Passage of House Bill 4472 would reverse the progress of the past hundred years by allowing special interests to insert their influence and to insert their own agenda at the expense of the public's health. I strongly urge this body to reject House Bill 4472. Thank you. The House and Senate have both decided to work through the weekend, and West Virginia Public Broadcasting will be bringing you live coverage of their meetings. The House will hold a public hearing tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. on several bills that call for a constitutional convention of states. Following the public hearing at 11 a.m., both chambers will hold morning floor sessions. You can watch both the public hearing and the live floor sessions on the West Virginia Channel or on our website, wvpublic.org. This has been the Legislature Today. I'm Ashton Mara. Thanks for joining us.
Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. West Virginia University, online at wvu.edu. AARP West Virginia, your ally for real possibilities in the Mountain State. Online at aarp.org wv. The West Virginia Higher Education Policy Commission, working to double the degrees produced annually in our state by 2025 through increased opportunities for West Virginians to earn the credentials today's economy demands. The High Technology Foundation, building a stronger West Virginia, online at wvhtf.org. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting, 